that says, here's how we're going to run the cottage, right? Now, and, and that, and, and there, were two, there were two issues, though, with that kind of agreement. One, how do you enforce it, right? If somebody decides not to do what they're going to do, does that mean, that means somebody else has got to go to court to enforce that? Well, where do you have to go to court? Well, you have to go here in Massachusetts. Well, in this case, you know, there's only one kid, Mary Jr.'s in Massachusetts. What about the one that's in San Diego? What if you're trying to enforce something against him? Are you going to court here in Massachusetts, right? This is a mess, right? So there, there are those kinds of issues regarding enforceability. Um, that's, then there are other issues if the three kids just own the property together. For example, take Mary Jr. As we indicated in the example, and maybe you even had experience with this, maybe Mary Jr. is not doing great financially, right? So if you've left your property to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., then that means that Mary Jr.'s share is actually subject to the claims of her creditors, right? So while Mary Jr. may not be able on her own to, to force the sale of the property, the creditors may be able on their own to become the owners of Mary Jr.'s share in the property, right? Because they can, because that's the law in Massachusetts. That's an issue. Uh, what about Peter's divorce issues, right? What about, the, the, so you, you, if Frank and Mary have both died and now Mary is getting a divorce from Peter. At the very least, unless if Peter owns a share of the cottage, then his, the value of that share is part of what gets considered by the divorce judge. Uh, in the worst case, the divorce judge has the right to say that Mary gets to use the cottage sometimes, right? How wonderful would that be? Um, Paul, we already talked about. Mary, we talked about. I'm going to go back to uh, no, I'm going to go back to Mary for a second, though. I just want to raise this one other issue. Um, as you know, and you should hear about it all the time. And once again, the older we get, the more we worry about it. We all worry about nursing home type issues. One of the reasons why we worry about that is because of this possibility that in order to qualify for Medicaid, we have to show that we have less than a certain amount of assets. And then once we show that we have less than that amount of assets, we can qualify for Medicaid. But then they put a lien on our property. Now, and that would be true for Frank and Mary, that's a whole separate topic regarding what, whether they might be trying to want to protect the cottage from that situation. But my issue here is once they've left it to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., that's also true for all of them, right? So if any of them, or if they leave the property to a grandchild, if any of the grandchildren is subject to a disability, then the value of their share in this cottage uh, is, is part of the determination of whether or not they are eligible for government benefits. So, there are several reasons why you may not want to be leaving property simply to individuals, right? I tried to give you several of them. I think they're pretty major, right? There are two other possibilities. One uh, is to put the property into trust to create some kind of a trust. A trust, legal definition of a trust, uh, a trust as opposed to a corporation or a limited liability company, which are all legally separate people. They just live for a long time. Uh, a trust is a, is a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who is a person who has legal control of something, for the benefit of beneficiaries, right? So I'm the trustee, and, or so you, we could, Frank and Mary could put their property in trust. They could hold the property in trust for the benefit of themselves and of their children as the beneficiaries and say, 
that when they die, that one or more of the other kids is going to hold the property as trustee for the benefit of the beneficiaries. This, my suggestion is, that, and that may work fine, you just want to make sure that you're doing, if you're, if you're using that device to solve these problems, well make sure that in doing that you've solved all the problems. So make sure that the trust device has got all this information in it. You know, whoever the trustees are who are controlling the property, who gets which week, what's the budget, who can be there, all of those questions. And they can all be defined inside of that trust document. Uh, a second possibility is the possibility that I kind of alluded to early on. If you were thinking about doing, especially if you were thinking about using a limited liability company um, for the benefit of avoiding the Massachusetts estate tax because you're not here, because you don't live here in Massachusetts and you live in a lower tax estate, that is also a very handy device for doing all of the things that we just talked about in the management agreement or the operating agreement in a limited liability company. You could lay out all the rules that we're now talking about. It's also a very simple device for laying out rules about who gets to vote on what the budget is, what that vote has to be, if the property goes from the children to the grandchildren, what are the shares that the grandchildren are have. And in terms of enforceability, now you have another entity that owns this property, right? A separate entity that owns the property. So there are no more issues about, well, how do we enforce the fact that if you haven't paid your bills, you can't use the cottage? Well, it's simple because you have no right to be in the cottage because the limited liability company owns the cottage. You don't have any kind of right to be there. The limited liability company can just tell you to not be there, right? Um, in terms of, um, what about if they haven't been paying the bills and so you want to uh, buy out their share? Well, the problem in that example where I was giving you the example, and I said, well, you know, you figure out the assessment and then you apply a discount and you have a promissory note over five years, and that's how it works. But the question is, well, well, what if the person who's being bought out says it isn't going to work that way and doesn't want to do it? Well, if he just simply owns the cottage jointly with the other two children, you can't force him to sign the document, right? You can't force him to sell, sign the bill of sale that says he's transferring his one-third share in return for all of this other stuff. Limited liability company would give you an easy way of doing that because you don't need anything from him. You don't need his signature on anything in order to enforce the rules, right? So there may be a number of reasons why you might want to think about that. Also, there are the tax advantages if you don't live in Massachusetts. I'm going to mention one other thing about the limited liability companies. In order to be able to take advantage of that tax advantage, you need to show that the limited liability company, which is out of state, was created for a business purpose. However, I would argue, and we've had these discussions among the, the, uh, the uh, real estate lawyers who do pretty much nothing but real estate. That's the advantage of that being in a large firm is that everybody gets to know a lot about something without anybody having to know anything about everything. So these folks were, were, were uh, suggesting to me that given the fact that your operating agreement is always going to have a section on what happens if there's a rental, remember we talked about that, what happens to li for liability purposes if there's a rental, one of the advantages of the limited liability company is if there is a rental um, and somebody gets sued as a result of a fall down or whatever, the other individuals aren't liable, it's just a limited liability company, right? Another one of those advantage, advantages is that you can say, well, the reason for the limited liability company is to take care of these rental issues, right? That's a perfectly legitimate business purpose, to make sure that Peter, Paul, and Mary are protected legally in the event that one of them is renting to somebody, which is a business relationship, and there's a fall down or whatever. Right. So there may be some reasons for doing that. So, um, no matter whether you're doing a, a trust agreement or a limited liability company, you've got to be dealing with how many votes it takes to win, what, what's a majority, right? Finally, um, uh, arbitration. You want to build into these agreements, whether it's a trust agreement or a limited liability company agreement, some kind of an arbitration clause that says, if we're disagreeing about this and we just can't come to a conclusion, it goes to arbitration. In Massachusetts, that can be binding arbitration, which is enforceable in court, right? If you don't have that kind of provision, 
Then when there's an argument, the final arbitrator is the judge. That's a very, very expensive uh, option and very difficult in situations like what we're talking about when there are often people living all over the country who do not want to be in the Massachusetts Superior Court figuring any of this out. The ultimate goal of all of these always is to sleep well at night, right? If you're not losing sleep about this stuff, you don't have to deal with it. If I've made you lose sleep by making you think about some of this stuff, I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't have to really do anything. That's really the goal. But I would suggest to you, you are doing your kids a favor. If you think this is a really special place and you want it to be special for them, by helping them figure this out before you die. Thank you very much. Any questions?